Hello and welcome to HD's weekly talk show, The Interview, and our special segment, Coffee on Sunday. How did Kareena Kapoor get size zero? Or Alia Bhatt lose 14 or perhaps 16 kgs? Who said diabetics could eat mangoes? And who initiated the Mumbai cops to opt for buttermilk instead of chai? One answer and one name, Rujuta Divekar, the nutritionist of the rich and famous. She's our guest this week in our special edition, Coffee on Sunday. Welcome to the show, Rujuta Divekar, and thank you for being here with us. Thank you, Ms. Chadda, for having me on your show. Let me begin by asking you, how does it feel to be known as a nutritionist of the rich and famous? Well, I think, uh, you know, labels are a part of one's uh, career and one learns to take them in one's stride and uh, take it sometimes uh, as a compliment or a backhanded compliment and not attach too much importance to it. So would you shun that label or are you proud of it? Well, I, uh, I would actually do nothing with it, you know, because it's not a label that I have added. We can call anyone anything that we uh, want. And I think that is something um, that, you know, if someone has an opinion about your career, and if they're able to express it freely, I think it's a good thing. You don't have to agree with uh, everything, nor do you have to go uh, and fight off people's opinions. It's it's nice that people have opinions on uh, on one's career. How many people get labeled? You know, not too many. So I guess the ones who get uh, labeled should just carry on with what they actually intend to do and not worry much about the labels. Okay. Tell me the story behind Karina Kapoor's size zero or Alia Bhatt losing, I think, 16 kgs or Anupam Kher losing 14. Uh, you know, uh, to tell you honestly, when I work I, in my office, I've been working since 1998 and I have never owned a weighing scale. So if you asked me how much my client weighed, I would not know. I don't know how much they weigh at the beginning. I don't know how much they weigh at the end. But what I do know is uh, what are their personal food preferences like? What is their routine like? What is their workout like? What has been their uh, dieting history? And what are the goals that they are working towards? And then my job essentially is about planning sustainable uh, diet plans and exercise plans for them so that they're able to reach those goals without needing to compromise on their food preferences, on their work or on their sanity. Whether it is with Karina or with Alia or with Anupam Care or Varun Dhawan, it's, you know, uh, my approach is pretty much the same. You said you don't know before or after how much yeah. your clients weigh. Wait. Isn't weight important? And I thought, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that weight is the first thing and, you know, you, every nutritionist puts them on the weighing machine before doing a diet plan. Weight is important if we are talking about uh, populations. You know, if you were uh, looking at, let's say, the population of a tribal village and seeing how much they weigh and then, you know, maybe coming out with an intervention that everyone will get a midday meal or a breakfast meal and then looking for a difference in that weight. If you're looking at population weight, then it can tell you that data is relevant. But in terms of individuals, how much we weigh 
really has nothing to do with uh, our health. It is possible for uh, a person to be heavily diabetic and therefore lose weight or simply have a bout of diarrhea and therefore lose weight. But fitness doesn't always necessarily lead to weight loss. It does lead to an improvement in body composition. So people get more toned, people get more muscular, people have better bone density, people begin to look younger, people begin to sleep better, have better regulated appetite. So when you work with individuals who actually have the luxury of rating them or assessing them on multiple parameters and not just on the parameter of uh, body weight because that can be quite misleading. So which means you don't make your clients jump on the weighing machine as soon as they walk in? Ever. I don't make them jump on the weighing machine ever. We also have research, uh, you know, which says that people who do extreme diets to lose weight, you know, they land up, their bodies begin to make metabolic adaptations in favor of weight gain. And then those metabolic adaptations continue to stay active even after they have lost the weight, even after they have gained the weight that they had lost, which is how you see people doing extreme diets for maybe two weeks or two months, knocking off a lot of weight and then regaining double the weight that they had uh, lost, you know, and we want to ensure that our clients don't go through any of those things. Uh, you know, even if they do assess by themselves on the weighing scale, then a sustainable rate of weight loss is 5 to 10% of body weight per year. So if I started off as a 100 kg person in June 2023, then by June 2024, I should be anywhere between 90 or 95 kilos, you know, and I shouldn't aim to be 90 or 95 kilos in July 23 or August 23, because then my body is not going to be able to retain the weight that it has uh, lost and it will then shortly come at the cost of my health. On a lighter note, tell mm. me about working with film stars. How erratic are they and how difficult is it to rein them in? I've just been fortunate enough to work with, even when I'm working with uh, film stars, I land up working with the A star, you know, I mean, A category of film stars. So they all come, uh, you know, with their feet grounded, with their head or on their shoulders. And they're working on a project. They want to give it their best. So I find it very, very easy, in fact, to work with uh, film stars. I have never seen even one person uh, misbehave or, uh, you know, behave rudely or badly. And uh, they're quite committed towards their own uh, fitness. So it, it actually makes my job very easy. To tell you very honestly, when I started working for in 1998 until 2003, I didn't have anyone who was outside of the film industry that I worked with. It's only after 2003 that I actually worked with someone who didn't belong to the film industry. Otherwise, it was largely word of mouth and largely just confined to working with people within the industry. So no, I'm yet to have a badly behaved uh, client. They, are, they aren't uh, erratic. Sometimes the work schedules are erratic. So you could have a night shift or you could be one day in Rajasthan, the next day in Ladakh and the third day somewhere in Serbia. So those are the challenges as to you know how you go about planning for every location or every work shift. But uh, as people, uh, you know, they're just as regular as uh, as all of us are. You said for several years, you did not work for anyone except people in the film industry. Mm -hmm. That is perhaps because the run of the mill or the common or the average people could not and perhaps cannot afford you. I'm not <laughs> asking your fee. I'm just yeah. saying as a yes. nutritionist of the rich and famous. Yes, yes. I mean, uh, yes, I think uh, that is, uh, you know, a valid point for the kind of uh, rates that we have. It does become inaccessible to a whole lot of people to work with me personally. I'm aware of that. I'm therefore not accessible to many people. I run projects on social media, which gives out information that is relevant to people's health. And, uh, you know, we run this very popular year on year project called as the fitness project, which we run at the beginning of every year, where we give out, uh, you know, food tips or workout tips, 
every week that people can integrate into their lifestyle and see changes on their ways to hip ratio on their acidity bloating sleep uh, weight and stuff and we do that free of cost because i think for um, you know i feel very grateful and indebted to all my readers for giving me everything that i have and uh, this is a small token of uh, thank you that uh, i can do so in that sense yes i would have to say that uh, the label then in a way is valid mr da <laughs> you know you just looked at our fees yes taking care of privacy issues of course and uh, you are at liberty not to name the film stars or people you work with take me through some interesting anecdotes with the rich and famous particularly in bollywood whether it's uh, karina or kangana or alia or varun or saif or karishma or um, you know uh, anupam kher now i'm working with vijay varma like they've all they're all very uh, good at their work they're also very good people and uh, something that i have seen in karina which i think every girl should kind of adopt is that she really backs herself up so if she gets on to a diet plan in the morning then by the same evening within the next 4 to 6 hours she sends me a message which is like i cannot even tell you how great i'm feeling i cannot even tell you how thin my face is uh, looking and how light i feel and she doesn't wait for people to compliment her you know i think her first compliment comes from herself so in that sense i feel that she is very very true to the character that she played in jab we met which is like my meri sabse favorite uh, so she she is actually like that even in real life what about her husband saif who also consults you how erratic is he or is he erratic he is not uh, erratic anymore he is he i think is one of those people who manages that fine balancing act really well where he is able to do his workout spend time with his uh, children and also work at looking after himself because given the profession that he is he has to look a certain uh, way he is aware of that and he uh, works towards it he's probably the only actor i know who reads voraciously you know so even if he is uh, waiting in my office for 2 minutes he would open a book for everyone else in the industry i would say that they would probably open instagram or their phones but not self self is opening books and reading them again without naming some of them will you give me a horrible story <laughs> i'm not had a horrible story in bollywood but i will surely tell you uh, maybe one of uh, the stories which um, you know so very early on in my uh, career i uh, i went to make this diet because at that time i would go to people's homes and uh, make their diets so this would be i think somewhere in early 2000 and uh, this was a very uh, rich woman an industrial family in like bandras posh neighborhoods they owned a large bungalow she had asked me to come and make her a diet i went in on time made her uh, the diet i would charge at that time 500 rupees for a uh, consultation and i uh, remember her uh, not paying me at the end of it because she was she just expected this to be free and she told me that uh, beta if i lose weight i will tell my friends and my friends are very rich so it will bring you more money so don't run after money of this uh, 500 rupees let your work speak for uh, yourself and then she uh, sent me off while coming back home that day i i spent 53 rupees on uh, a rickshaw ride back home and it was it is the most expensive 53 rupees that i have uh, ever spent because i intended to spend that 53 only from the 500 that i would earn from her over a period of time i learned that in my kind of work you have to charge first and work later so i think our experiences make us so while that time it felt really terrible it it kind of ensured that i don't suffer from this over and over uh, again you know with with bollywood there has been no no such experience have you ever rejected any client from bollywood who would or or the rich and famous who would want you to counsel and you said no i i don't reject anyone as long as uh, you know they are following all our uh, policies and uh, stuff but i have said uh, no once to 
a cricketer's uh, wife because she wanted me to come over to her hotel and uh, make her diet versus really her coming to my office and uh, you know getting her a uh, plan done so it's more out of logistics that i have uh, uh, you know not worked with people than any kind of personal uh, grudges and stuff you are sought after and you talk a lot of sense but you also have extreme views for instance the controversial one of saying diabetics can eat mangoes <laughs> well uh, you know it sounds controversial only because um, you know in a country like india the only fruits that we are very about are mangoes sitafal banana uh, jackfruit you know fruits which are essentially local native and have names in our uh, local and regional languages however if you look at the american diabetic association or any other evidence based guidelines whether one has diabetes or doesn't have diabetes one is encouraged to have a fresh seasonal fruit mango is nothing else but a fresh seasonal fruit there is no reason for us to believe that apple and kiwis and berries are good for us but uh, a banana or a mango or uh, you know a sitafal is not good for us that doesn't come out of science it comes out of a bias and uh, these kind of biases are common in all colonized uh, countries you know where we kind of look down in one way or the other uh, we look down upon our food upon our rituals upon, upon our uh, languages upon many other things and knowingly or unknowingly we wait for the west to approve of it so you can see that um, you know you can see it happening with haldi dood that maybe we didn't value it enough till it was called golden milk or turmeric latte uh, we have no value for uh, ghee maybe till it is called uh, clarified butter or and stuff by the west the often repeated lie that mango is dangerous for us sounds like the truth when it is not the truth you know all fresh fruits are good for all kinds of people including the ones who uh, you know who have uh, diabetes they can safely have a mango glamour apart you have done a lot of commendable and serious work with tribals your ragi kheer project for instance you started it much much before years before the bjp government popularized millet yes. yeah yeah in fact the ragi which is the finger millet the red finger millet in uh, the tribal district that i work with which also happens to be our ancestral uh, property at one time everyone would just grow nagli or uh, ragi in that region and over a period of time everyone switched to growing more rice so um ragi was a part of the diet an integral part of the diet about 50 60 years ago and then it kind of changed to uh, not eating ragi anymore so the project that we run is about having ragi porridge as a breakfast meal across 10 to 13 tribal padas every single morning it's a meal of uh, ragi milk and some jaggery and the children love it and it has improved school attendance it has improved their health outcomes you know they don't fall as sick as often they're growing uh, they're growing well so you know there is lesser wasting there is lesser stunting in uh, the children who are eating this breakfast meal because the government also provides another uh, midday meal in school so that's been a project that we are uh, very proud of and uh, you know it's a project that is very very uh, close to our uh, heart and it is nice that uh, you know the government also now has this whole initiative of uh, the millet uh, mission because if it comes back if millets come back to the pds or the public distribution system and you know if we begin to have millets as a part of the ration that everyone the vulnerable sections of the society can have access to if uh, the government begins to buy millets at an msp i think it is going to be great for all of us i think it's good if the government is mainstreaming uh, millets when did you start this project how many years ago 
we started this in uh, 2016 2016 yes yes when we started we started with only one pada with just our pada by the time it, we actually took it across all padas it was about 2018 if i'm not uh, mistaken and none of this would be possible without the support of local panchayats without the support of uh, anganwadi teachers and without the support of uh, primary school teachers so for any project to be successful there are many uh, nameless faceless uh, people and even agencies which are actually working towards ensuring that it is complied with on a day to day uh, basis our ragi kheer is also cooked by uh, bachat gat so, you know bachat gat is basically small women cooperatives which come together and uh, cook these meals so one of the reasons why i'm proud of this project is because it is really a community based project which is led by the community so a lot of us come together and uh, you know make this happen on a day to day uh, basis so you started it several years before the government thought of it and as usual you were ahead of your time thank you like i said we're not ahead of uh, our time by uh, you know by any sense of my imagination nagli or ragi was always a part of the diet it had disappeared and we simply reintroduced it you know you also fed pregnant women on the yes. ragi keep yes and the results were very encouraging and if i'm right probably it was the rare times when kids ab- weighing above 3 kg were born in tribal areas yes 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 so um, so the ragi kheer rather than children we also provide ragi kheer to all pregnant and lactating uh, women and what we found is that the birth weight of their children went up so one of the women gave birth to a 3 kg uh, baby which was a cause of big celebration in the whole pada because typically we have very small or uh, underweight babies you know simply because uh, tribals don't have adequate access to food and just this one small intervention made a massive change what about mumbai cops and your helping them lose weight i'm told they no longer eat vada pav or perhaps eat it less than they used to the mumbai police i feel does a whole lot of work and sometimes i feel maybe they don't get appreciated as much as uh, they should be for given the size of our city and given the workload that the force manages uh, and because they work under extreme pressure i think given their work environment they don't land up eating on time they don't land up sleeping on time and they surely don't land up uh, exercising that's when we uh, decided to launch this uh, project for the mumbai police welfare welfare project where we would bring in small changes into their day to day habits so that they would no longer suffer from the most common problems that they would suffer from which was uh, weight gain right from the time that they joined the forces acidity bloating backache poor sleep indigestion and uh, some of the things that we asked them to do was to replace a cup of chai with chas or buttermilk to replace a cup of chai with uh, a nimbu sharbat or a kokum sharbat which is easily available and then to have you know to spare at least one roti from their uh, lunch which they could then have between 4 and 6 pm in the evening so that they would not overeat for dinner or land up having some kind of uh, noodles chow mein or vada pav or misal pav at uh, the wrong hour and just these small changes really helped them not just lose weight but also feel better with their acidity with their headaches and they began to sleep better they had more energy uh, on a day to day basis so if we look at a mumbai cop today who's looking fine and fit can we say it is thanks to ruchita divekar well you know what can i say mr chatta it's like a my profession is all about taking credit for other people's hard work you know so uh, but the fact is that people only get fit because they commit to making small changes in their day to day habits why did you decide and how did the idea of working with tribals come about and also your project of taking school kids urban school kids to a farm every weekend 
you i believe grew up with cows <laughs> yes yeah i belong to a to a farming family from my father's uh, side uh, you know i'm like the fifth generation on this farm that uh, you know which is called sonave that uh, place is called sonave and other than our family everyone else around is a tribal so uh, i decided to simply work with my neighbors they happen to be uh, tribals and uh, you know palghar district where so now comes from is also known for having very high malnourishment uh, rates so that was also another reason why we dis- why we felt that this intervention would be useful and it has been useful in these uh, 14 paras that we uh, work with Uh, a well-fed child is more attentive at school falls sick less often can actually do something with their uh, lives and careers and a well-fed child has the best chance to break out of the cycle of uh, poverty so that's really the main motivation uh, of this project for the urban kids a lot of times urban kids are absolutely clueless about where fruits and vegetables come from you know they actually feel that they come from the racks of malls when they actually come from the earth and soil and i feel that if and i have seen this with my eyes that a child's life is enriched when they get their hands dirty with uh, farming a child's life is uh, you know there is a lot of value addition when they are able to look at a tree and tell that this is a mango tree and that is a lychee tree and uh, you know this is a mirchi and that is a bengan and small things like different shapes of mirchis or tomato make them laugh and you know bring happiness to their life so it's actually uh, quite nice to be uh, working with children and what we have observed and what their parents tell us is that from the time that they have begun farming they now do less drama with food they have more respect for what is on their uh, plate and they are no longer demanding of junk food like the way they used to before they got exposed to uh, farming your one rule don't touch the food that ads promote tell me about that but i think if there is an ad it's bad you know you a lot of times people feel that they should be eating certain things only because ads go after them with those messages over and uh, over again like for example eating uh, noodles in uh, you know high up in mountains it's just a ad promoted concept you know otherwise you should be eating local food but people who make local food and promote local food don't have the budgets that the food industry has so uh, you know the fact is that if there is an ad it's bad if anyone has had the budget to actually put out an ad about their food or food product then it should not be on your uh, plate so there should be no ketchups that you should be eating people should not be picking up free uh, fruit can those uh, canned fruit juices that they get on flights and bringing them back home and drinking it chocolates should not be something that we should be giving our children as a gift so we just need to be uh, you know better aware of the food choices that we make on a day to day basis what do you have against the food industry maybe i'm using a strong term and why are you constantly at war with them well, i'm not at war with uh, anyone you know i think in my profession one of the biggest things that uh, Uh, i am involved in is education and advocacy you know i don't believe in um, uh, you know going at war or calling out uh, anyone but educating and advocating because i am in this for the long run i've been working until 1998 i want to work in this field till the last uh, breath i take i want changes that people bring into their lifestyle to last forever for their grandchildren to inherit those food changes and those uh, and the and the values and those food values i'm not looking at uh, trending for a day or two i'm not looking at uh, a change lasting people for about one or two months so uh, education and advocacy is what i believe in, right so that people are more aware of the choices that they make versus really getting floored or carried away by uh, you know by the constant narrative that the weight loss and the food industry keeps building around us on a personal note you love trekking and it was during a trek that you met the man you finally married 
take me through that uh well i was uh, trekking in ladakh we actually started our trek in uh, kashmir and uh, you know then we ended it in uh, ladakh and i think uh, when you are young and when you are in uh, mountains your know, mountains are romantic wo bhi husn pahadon ka if you heard of that song it lagta hai aise jahan apni ho shaadi i think that literally happened to uh, both me and my uh, partner and that's how we landed up even uh, getting married in the himalay and you ultimately and finally got married in a krishna temple had set aside a budget of 25000 rupees but ended up spending only 5 that's right because i think uh, ma getting married in the mountains is uh, priceless when i when we spoke to uh, the pandit ji at uh, you know at this krishna temple which is the old capital of uh, kullu valley it's called the krishna temple at uh, thava he first asked me if my parents knew that i was planning to get married and i said yes they did know he hosted us for chai and he said he would also have us for lunch and we were going to be a total of 10 or 15 people that's how i had budgeted 25000 but he calculated the whole amount and he said that it's it's going to be 5000 and i think the mumbai kar in me just jumped at the deal so i was sure that i wanted a small intimate uh, wedding which would not uh, you know put a big hole into uh, our pockets but i think at 5000 rupees it was almost like uh, having a meal for two at a gourmet restaurant went it was in um, august where the apples were uh, you know ripening on the trees in that uh, region there were apples there were peaches there were pears and of course there was uh, the shri krishna temple so that's how i think the marriage landed up happening from being a warm up instructor to reaching where you have what have been the road blocks actually i have not had uh, as many road blocks i have actually had uh, a pretty enabling environment the kind of journey that i have uh, had where i would probably make uh, 100 rupees at the end of uh, you know one hour to making more than that uh, this is a story of many people who uh, live in mumbai i think a lot of my growth story has to do with uh, india's growth story also and that's how uh, i have grown i don't think i would be able to do this without um, you know serious changes that have happened uh, in india looking back what are the things in your life which you would wish could change or memories you would want erased none really you know i i don't think that there is any memory that i would uh, want erased i don't think that uh, you know if i got a second chance at doing it i don't think i would have done anything differently uh, from the way i have done it except for maybe one thing that uh, in 2002 i was uh, trying to uh, buy a house and i applied for a home loan and my home loan wouldn't get passed it was for 13 lakhs and my home loan wouldn't get passed because uh, they were not sure whether i would be able to pay the emi of uh, 15000 rupees every month they would not give it because they're like kya fitness professional matlab aap kya karte ho exactly you know how much will you uh, really earn and how will you pay this uh, money month on month and that's when i remember that you know at one time at a bank standing there and i lectured that accountant saying that do you know that in the future fitness professionals will make as much as ceos do you know that fitness professionals is amongst the top 5 growing uh, professions that i will make double the money that i'm making by the time it's the second or the third year but you will barely make a 10% increment in your uh, salary you know i th- that is something i regret i wish i had uh, more grace uh you know and more wisdom to not talk like that to uh, anyone at all so i think other than that uh, i wouldn't want to change anything you, know? you are a bharatnatyam dancer and you also sing what are the other things that people do not know about you who is the real rujita divekt i come from a maharashtrian family so learning to sing classical music and learning to you know dance at least one classical uh, dance form is like almost compulsory 
I think uh, probably the only uh, thing that people may not know about me is that I, uh, you know, that I, I've really begun to enjoy cooking since, uh, since the lockdown. I think it's a joy I discovered during lockdown. On that note, Rujuta Devikar, thank you very much. Thank you for being here and thank you for your time. Thank you very much. See you.